Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And actually, first of all, I know some people got to grab it, but uh, we've got some samples of my cheese and Bo's wonderful juice. So if you want to offend me if you get up while I'm talking to try some, that's why we brought them, so you all get to try it as well as hear about our business. So I started a artisan cheesemaking business. So one th probably the first thing people ask me when uh, I'm chatting with them about it is, how did you get into that? You have an engineering degree. Well, when you say uh, I have an engineering degree, but I own a manufacturing business, you know, it makes a lot more sense. So I've always been uh, excited by that kind of creative side of the engineering. So I made uh, cheese as a hobby for about four years. I was living in Colorado. I had a bunch of friends that were home brewers. So I wanted to make something kind of like that, but they were already making great beer. So I didn't want to have my horrible first attempts at beer sitting right next to their nice beer. So I uh, decided to make cheese. Moved back to Little Rock, kept growing up, and just like he was talking about, you know, uh, had just such a wonderful support network here with some of the local restaurants and uh, stores. They were really excited to have a local product. So I started a business, having no idea what I was getting into. Well, it's gone real well. We're just uh, nearly three years old. I have one full-time employee and a couple of seasonal employees. We uh, have gone from making cheese in small stove uh, stock pots on top of a stove to a 500 gallon vat. We've got a big walk-in uh, cheese cave that's about as big as this area underneath the lower ceiling up here, just full of cheese. That's pretty awesome. Uh, really the reason I wanted to get into it other than it's just a fun business is that, you know, probably for a lot of the same reasons Bo would talk about is that food in America has kind of stagnated for a little bit. Uh, people have not really cared what they're eating or what goes into it and people are starting to care again so that's really cool they want to know where the food comes from they want to know that they can trust the people making it and also they just want higher quality stuff uh, regardless of the the food safety and everything so there's no reason that it has cheese has to be made over in europe they just have a longer tradition of doing it we've got wonderful milk here in arkansas and it's actually a lot of fun because i've been able to pair or been able to partner with uh uh, local farmers and dairy producers, uh, goat and cow, and hopefully sheep in the future. We've got a line on that to get wonderful local milk. Due to the recent law changes in Arkansas, we're actually able to use raw milk or real milk. Uh, you know, it's it's just it's great. It's a lot of fun. So over the last three years, you know, we've kind of been uh, expanding. We started off in a church kitchen the Trinity Episcopal Cathedral just over by the governor's mansion. They very generously let us use their, their kitchen there to, as a production facility. We now moved into, a, we're in a warehouse over just past uh, the Heifer Project, sharing it with a few other businesses. And actually we have under construction our own space over on 6th and Main, right downtown and the new uh, Main Street redevelopment going on that uh, we'll have kind of the same setup as a brewery where we have the production got windows looking in so you can see the aging room and the production room as well as uh, tours and a tasting room with cheese, wine, and beer. And in fact, uh, since he was mentioning social media, it's kind of a, a testament to how well that works because really I just grabbed that, that Twitter handle uh, just to kind of park it. I haven't put a single post on it. I had some ideas for cool things we can do in conjunction with tours. We already have like a hundred or so followers even though I've never posted anything on it. <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Uh, does anybody have any, any questions? Would you like me to talk about anything um, specifically? No, we'll, get, we'll get, to that, get to that through questions. So um, first question, let's see. Uh, this week, make sure that, um, you say your name and who you're with. I'm going to pass around the microphone for each person. I'm Glenna Cook, and I'm with Nona Moses, it's a music company. Uh, I, I love cooking and I love cheese. I want to know how you make cheese. Well, that's a great question. So uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I can do a real quick overview of it right here. But uh, also, just to let you know, when we do move into our downtown space, which believe me, I wish I had a date to give you, but it'll be done when it's done. We uh, will have tours there so you can see the cheese being made. We'll also have cheese making classes. And I've actually run into a few people who make cheese at home. The hardest part about making, you know, the hard aged cheeses is having a place to age it. A refrigerator really doesn't work. You have to have your own space for it. So I've offered and a couple of people have taken up 
the opportunity that they can age their homemade cheese in our cave, which is pretty fun. And we'll maintain it for them because we're already doing it to 600 other wheels, so it's one more. Uh, so, but to, to your question, just real quick, uh, the basic process is, you know, you take milk and good uh, raw milk, which means it hasn't been pasteurized or heat treated to kill uh, any potentially harmful bacteria in there is always the best, the raw milk, due to various chemical reasons. Uh, but anyway, we use milk, we heat it up to about 70 degrees, add in our culture, which is the bacteria that ages the cheese. It's kind of like the yeast in beer or wine, it's what gives it the, it's what turn, turns those sugars into acids, gives it flavor. We add in rennet, which is an enzyme that hardens the milk into a curd. It's about the consistency of jello cut that curd into little pieces. We're gonna cook those pieces to kind of harden them. When I say cook, it's low temperature. We don't ever go above 120 degrees. It's much higher than that, you get to pasteurization temperatures, which we don't wanna do for our milk. Uh, however we cook it, we pull the curds out, we put them in molds, or just uh, forms, plastic forms, especially made for cheese making, that press it into all these little bits into a wheel. And then those wheels age in our cave, which is 52 degrees and high humidity. Just a walk-in cooler we repurpose, but when we're downtown, we'll actually have an underground cellar. Uh, anyway, it'll, they'll age there for months or years. That's where all the flavor comes from, so you really have to wait. That's one of the unique uh, challenges of the cheese-making business is that you can't just make it then sell it. It's got to age three months or years or whatever. I mean, uh, I don't know that we've hit it yet, <laughs> but uh, oh, just just the the day to day logistics. Uh, I, I I would say that the biggest challenge really is just the getting a getting a manufacturing business up off the ground is really expensive. Uh, there's a lot of equipment. There's a it could have been done cheaper if I had a lot of money, ironically, because I wouldn't have had to use the uh, the the middle of the road equipment uh, size-wise. I could have just jumped straight to the big equipment I'm getting now. So really just that kind of uh, excited terror of being a business owner is probably the, the, the most difficult, most, the biggest challenge, you know? Because there's always, I, I could mention any of a hundred little or big hurdles we've had to deal with, but really the hardest part is just the fact that at three years I'm really starting to love it and love the lifestyle now, so I actually have something to lose. So the first year, it's kind of like, well, if this cheese thing doesn't work out, then well, at least I have a lot of cheese. <laughs> but now, you know, it's a lifestyle. It's something I love. We're actually starting to build partnerships with other businesses. We're actually starting to, you know, have clientele that like the product and want to be able to get it every week. And so, you know, it's scary that all of these individual challenges, that, you know, I mean, we're doing great, but, you know, it's just always scary. Oh, of course. Well, thank you so much for that compliment. I, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, my website, the Kent Walker Cheese, if you click on where to buy, it's got the full list. But, uh, for instance, here in Little Rock, uh, Whole Foods has it, Stratton's Market downtown, the Green Corner store. And honestly, you know, any, um, uh, any shop that you think should have it, just tell them they ought to have it because we'll deliver to anybody, you know. The, the the Kiva thing? No. No oh, it was, it was it was wonderful. Uh, we fundraised in a flabbergastingly short amount of time. I did a ten thousand uh, dollar Kiva loan, which is for people that that don't know. They're a, they're a nonprofit. They're associated with the Clinton Foundation, and they've typically been for third world countries for small businesses. They just created another part of their business called Kiva Zip, which is for uh, America and other first world countries, I think, but just America now, I guess, uh, for small businesses here. So I got a $10,000 loan. It's, uh, it's crowdfunded. Uh, it was a two-year term, and it was about a year and a quarter ago, so I'm about a year and a quarter paid off. 
we used the money to buy that big vat I was talking about, that 500-gallon vat, which is about 12 feet long by 4 feet wide. It's bigger than a hot tub. It's huge. And we fill it with milk and make cheese. So it was absolutely essential to our business to get that because before that we were making cheese in two very small vats, 25 and 30 gallons. We were doing 12 production runs a week, uh, which is a lot. You can tell it's, more, it's much more than one a day. So um, that brought us down to two production runs a week and making actually more cheese. So it was instrumental and it's been wonderful. I'm actually now a trustee for them. So I'm always excited to pass that opportunity along to other folks too. There actually was. Uh, we, there, there's, there's a couple aspects to that. Uh, I actually started to try to do it when the business was very new. Uh, and we're not just doing stores, it's also a restaurant and farmer's markets. So kind of direct. Um, kind of just going off of the brewery winery model, you know, that's, that's the business I know. My parents have a wine broker company and I've worked at wineries and breweries and distilleries, so I just know that business. Uh, also, cheese is hard to ship. You know, it melts. We're in the south. Uh, if you look at cheesemakers' websites, they typically only ship during the winter. Uh, and also, especially at the beginning when, I, when it was just me doing it, uh, cheese is labor-intensive to make. It takes eight hours to make a batch of cheese. You have to maintain all of your cheese that you've already made every day, and you have to go out and pound the streets. So the fulfillment on doing just, oh, I want one retail pack of cheese, like one piece that size, ship to you know Jonesboro or whatever and then you get a hundred of those a day it was too much to do the fulfillment and in fact we do plan on doing e-commerce eventually but you know we're struggling just to keep up with our wholesale orders right now with the larger amount so if you had the same amount of cheese going out in those retail packs I mean we just wouldn't be able to fulfill the demand with the uh, few people that we have Well, that's a great question. You know, as three years old, we're pretty much out of the research phase now, other than, you know, we kept one of those small vats. We're always experimenting with different cheeses. And when we have kind of a one-off, we take it to a sh certain chefs that we like or to the farmer's markets where, you know, things that you may never see again are appreciated. So that's kind of our research department there because sometimes if it goes real well, we'll, we'll make it again. But, uh, you know, we really did a huge amount of research at the beginning. Uh, I've run into uh, other businesses I've worked for, production businesses that didn't do the proper amount of research uh, before they released their product out. And it was a disaster, it nearly ended the company and it's, you know, years later they were still feeling the, still feeling the results of that because they kind of had an inferior product. So we did six months of research where I made cheese, I made all the different types of cheeses we were gonna do uh, and then just gave them away. Didn't sell them, just gave them away, got, tried to get feedback on it, and just kind of learned how to make cheese before we sold anything. And, you know, that was, that was really difficult to do financially, but it has paid off just in spades since. But now it's marketing, marketing, marketing at three years old because we've got our core cheeses. We're always playing around with others, but we got to sell these ones that we're going to be making forever. So you bet. Well, I wish I could just make cheese all day. I, I really do. I, I, and, and go to the farmer's markets. That would be the ideal. But no, I mean, you have to, uh, you have to get out and sell it. And the unfortunate thing is as much as I would love to hire like a salesperson 
they're one of the most expensive types of, of positions that there are because uh, we can't afford to do anybody on commission yet because we just don't have the volume that would make it worth anybody's time. And paying somebody hourly to sell the amount of cheese that we have is unrealistic at this point. So I have to be out in the field all the time. In fact, I got that question from a winemaker that he said, my parents have a, the wine broker company, and what I'm doing goes very well with that. So we do a lot of paired events. And I was ta ch chatting with one of the winemakers at, at Montanor, and he asked me that same question, you know, because he's kind of taking me under his wing a bit. And he says, you know, are you spending enough time in the market? And, you know, my answer that I gave to him and I give to anybody is, you know, more than I would like to and nowhere near enough as I should, you know, because that's what sells it is getting out there and doing it and working on the business and talking to to finance sources and sell, and calling people to get orders and all that stuff, you know. So really my focus in the last six months has been you get really good people hired, get them trained very well so that I just don't have to worry about the operation of the business. So it can just go. Because last year when I was having to travel, every time I left for over two days, I came back and I had to fix all of the cheese in the aging cave. They'd all been you know, damaged in some subtle way because they weren't getting attention. And while I was able to fix it and the cheese was sellable, that of course meant our quality was lower than it is now. So that's one of the nice things too. Get two at once. Well, thank you so much, you know, uh, for that. I, I love being at the farmer's markets. It absolutely recharges me when that, all that fear stuff I was talking about comes up. I go to the farmer's market and I see wonderful folks like, like y'all enjoying it. It totally recharges me. So uh, thank you all for, for being that part. Uh, the best selling, I don't know. I'm tempted to say the habanero cheddar just because everybody likes it's cheddar. That's the most popular cheese in the world. And it's uh, the habanero. People love that. But honestly, they all sell pretty evenly. We've got six uh, kind of core cheeses that we're making all the time. One of them we just added from a seasonal to the, the, the core cheese. So they, I guess we picked the, the mix well, but uh, that's under the, the cheeses section there on the website because they all sell pretty well. We do. We definitely do goat cheeses as well as cow cheeses. We've been getting a good local raw cow milk from day one with the company from Blufftop Farm. We just added another farm, Owl Ridge Farm, which is just north of here. And then we uh, also just were able to add a, a um, cow farm also. So we switched off of the kind of store-bought pasteurized milk to real raw cow milk as well. And uh, we love, you know, goat, cow, both great just have some different uh, flavor to them, different chemical structures that kind of lend themselves to different styles of cheese making. And we even have a line on some uh, sheep milk cheese, hopefully soon as well, or sheep milk rather, hopefully soon as well. You mean like a restaurant telling some another restaurant they should use it or something? I think it happens all the time, especially amongst. Uh, uh, I guess for people in the back, he asked about business referral. You know, how many, how much do people recommend my cheese to others? I mean, I think it happens all the time. I mean, I've never paid for advertising. I go out and beat the streets and do cold calls, but still, we're seeing a whole lot of growth in um, in addition to that. So. People must be doing it a lot more than I even realize, and it's, of course, incredibly important, I think, to any business for that. Oh, of course. I mean, it's the only leg we have to stand on. You know, the fact uh, he asked if that is, has to do with the quality of the product, and absolutely, you know, because it's handmade, because we don't have the volume of production and the automated equipment, it has to be more expensive than some of the mass-produced cheese. It's just all there is to it. 
it's not more expensive than equivalent cheese. We work really hard to keep the price point the same spot as equivalent cheese, but we have to make sure that it is equivalent quality-wise. Yes, that was that was the uh, Lester that I brought, and that's one of the neat things about cheese. So, uh, I mentioned the difficulties of having a product that has to age months before it's ready. Well, we're doing three-month aged cheeses, just kind of standard now. That's kind of our our minimum of a balance between it's not that long to wait, and it is starting to get some really good flavors at three months. But it's still kind of a smooth slicing cheese. You know, all those samples I brought are three months. So it's kind of a it's, uh, it's called a semi-hard cheese. Uh, as you age, really any of those that I brought, but the feta, any, any cheese with a rind, you know, really, you can age it to years. That Lester I brought for that event was aged, I think it was 19 or 20 months at that time. And uh, it was made from the pasteurized milk that we were getting two years ago. So I'm kind of actually, as they approach the two-year mark, trying to get rid of all of those wheels because they're, they're really good, but they're just not going to last much longer due to being pasteurized. So it's kind of fun that I get to get I get we get to try all this reserve cheese because as a as a startup company, you know, we don't have the the finances to age a lot of cheese that long. We basically, when we put a wheel back to reserve, we're basically writing it off and saying, okay, we're not going to make money on this wheel. And uh, eventually, we will definitely be having cheese that's available that's reserved cheese regularly. But one thing that we do now that's really exciting is the reserve cheese program. It's kind of like a CSA with a farm, if you know those, where you can contact me. There's info on the website, actually, under the cheeses in the reserve section there. What you can do is we can, you pay us half, you know, up front, so our cost is covered on the cheese, and we'll age cheese as long as you want. So if you like the Lester, the habanero cheddar at three months, and you want to try it as a year or two or five years, you can reserve a wheel, or you and your office can, or it's a great Christmas presents, or whatever you like. We have time for one more question, if anyone has it. All right. So what we do every single week, Kent, is we, we leave you with one thing that you want to ask the community for that will help your business. So what's the one thing, that action item, that they can leave today and help your business? Well, thank you. That's an awesome request and I have a major one actually so I've been talking a lot about raw milk and legally from the federal level making raw milk uh, cheese is totally cool we just only have we just have to age it for 60 days well you know in Arkansas some of you may know some of you may not just a couple of years ago we had the law changed so that it is now legal for consumers to buy raw milk directly off the farm well they didn't say anything about manufacturers it's kind of a gray area right now so I'm buying it, my people are licensed, but the health department is really not wanting me to use raw milk. Not because it's dangerous, because they don't want more work. They're understaffed and they don't, it's unfortunate, but the health department doesn't know a whole lot about food science, unfortunately. I hope there's no health department people here. I do not mean that <laughs> offensively. It's, there's a lot of good people there that just want to make food safe. I, I really believe that. But unfortunately, I'm getting a lot of pressure to not use raw milk. So I don't know if anybody here knows anybody at the health department, but I don't know if that would even help. But just the awareness that, that raw milk is safe, cheese making is a process that uh, is equivalent to pasteurization safety-wise. It, it is a process that would remove any bad, any potential harmful bacteria that might be there. So just the awareness. Just talk to people about it. Just learn a little bit about it yourself. Look it up on the internet. Just be aware as a consumer, because this is an issue I'm facing. And just right as we're, our cheese is starting to be really high quality, I really hope we don't have to stop using those good local ingredients. And, and, and on that, we've had another presenter, Mike Ocov, who has the ability for you to go out on their website and actually see the cheese that they have that That would be wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for having me. And thanks.